Chapter One North and South. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Margaret T. in New South Wales, Australia, August 2006. North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. Chapter One Haste to the Wedding wooed and married and all. "'Edith,' said Margaret gently, "'Edith!' But, as Margaret half suspected, Edith had fallen asleep. She lay curled up on the sofa in the back drawing-room in Harley Street, looking very lovely in her white muslin and blue ribbons. If Titania had ever been dressed in white muslin and blue ribbons, and had fallen asleep on a crimson damask sofa in a back drawing-room, Edith might have been taken for her. Margaret was struck afresh by her cousin's beauty. They had grown up together from childhood, and all along Edith had been remarked upon by everyone, except Margaret, for her prettiness. But Margaret had never thought about it until the last few days, when the prospect of soon losing her companion seemed to give force to every sweet quality and charm which Edith possessed. They had been talking about wedding dresses and wedding ceremonies, and Captain Lennox and what he had told Edith about her future life at Corfu, where his regiment was stationed and the difficulty of keeping a piano in good tune, a difficulty which Edith seemed to consider as one of the most formidable that could befall her in her married life, and what gowns she should want in the visits to Scotland, which would immediately succeed her marriage. But the whispered tone had latterly become more drowsy, and Margaret, after a pause of a few minutes, found, as she fancied, that in spite of the buzz in the next room, Edith had rolled herself up into a soft ball of muslin and ribbon and silken curls, and gone off into a peaceful little after-dinner nap. Margaret had been on the point of telling her cousin of some of the plans and visions which she entertained as to her future life in the country parsonage, where her father and mother lived, and where her bright holidays had always been passed, though for the last ten years her aunt Shaw's house had been considered as her home. But in default of a listener she had to brood over the change in her life silently as heretofore. It was a happy brooding, although tinged with regret at being separated for an indefinite time from her gentle aunt and dear cousin. As she thought of the delight of filling the important post of only daughter in Helston Parsonage, pieces of the conversation out of the next room came upon her ears. Her aunt Shaw was talking to the five or six ladies who had been dining there, and whose husbands were still in the dining-room. They were the familiar acquaintances of the house, neighbours whom Mrs. Shaw called friends, because she happened to dine with them more frequently than with any other people, and because if she or Edith wanted anything from them, or they from her, they did not scruple to make a call at each other's houses before luncheon. These ladies and their husbands were invited, in their capacity of friends, to eat a farewell dinner in honour of Edith's approaching marriage. Edith had rather objected to this arrangement, for Captain Lennox was expected to arrive by a late train this very evening. But, although she was a spoiled child, she was too careless and idle to have a very strong will of her own, and gave way when she found that her mother had absolutely ordered those extra delicacies of the season which are always supposed to be efficacious against moderate grief at farewell dinners. She contented herself by leaning back in her chair, merely playing with the food on her plate and looking grave and absent, while all around her were enjoying the modes of Mr. Gray, the gentleman who always took the bottom of the table at Mrs. Shaw's dinner-parties, and asked Edith to give them some music in the drawing-room. Mr. Gray was particularly agreeable over this farewell dinner, and the gentlemen stayed downstairs longer than usual. It was very well they did, to judge from the fragments of conversation which Margaret overheard. "'I suffered too much myself, not that I was not extremely happy with the poor dear general, but still disparity of age is a drawback, one that I was resolved Edith should not have to encounter.' Of course, without any maternal partiality, I foresaw that the dear child was likely to marry early. Indeed, I had often said that I was sure she would be married before she was nineteen. I had quite a prophetic feeling when Captain Lennox, and here the voice dropped into a whisper, but Margaret could easily supply the blank. The course of true love in Edith's case had run remarkably smooth. Mrs. Shaw had given way to the presentiment, as she expressed it, and had rather urged on the marriage although it was below the expectations which many of Edith's acquaintances had formed for her, a young and pretty heiress. But Mrs. Shaw said that her only child should marry for love, and sighed emphatically, as if love had not been her motive for marrying the general. 
Mrs. Shaw enjoyed the romance of the present engagement rather more than her daughter. Not but that Edith was very thoroughly and properly in love. Still, she would have certainly preferred a good house in Belgravia to all the picturesqueness of the life which Captain Lennox described at Corfu. The very parts which made Margaret glow as she listened, Edith pretended to shiver and shudder at, partly for the pleasure she had in being coaxed out of her dislike by her fond lover, and partly because anything of a gypsy or makeshift life was really distasteful to her. Yet had any one come with a fine house and a fine estate and a fine title to boot, Edith would still have clung to Captain Lennox while the temptation lasted. When it was over, it is possible she might have had little qualms of ill-concealed regret that Captain Lennox could not have united in his person everything that was desirable. In this she was but her mother's child, who, after deliberately marrying General Shaw with no warmer feeling than respect for his character and establishment, was constantly, though quietly, bemoaning her hard lot in being united to one whom she could not love. "'I have spared no expense in her trousseau,' were the next words Margaret heard. "'She has all the beautiful Indian shawls and scarves the general gave to me, but which I shall never wear again.' "'She is a lucky girl,' replied another voice, which Margaret knew to be that of Mrs. Gibson, a lady who was taking a double interest in the conversation, from the fact of one of her daughters having been married within the last few weeks. "'Helen had set her heart upon an Indian shawl, but really, when I found what an extravagant price was asked, I was obliged to refuse her. She will be quite envious when she hears of Edith having Indian shawls. What kind are they? Delhi? With the lovely little borders?' Margaret heard her aunt's voice again, but this time it was as if she had raised herself up from her half-recumbent position, and were looking into the more dimly lighted back drawing-room. "'Edith! Edith!' cried she, and then she sank as if wearied by the exertion. Margaret stepped forward. "'Edith is asleep, Aunt Shaw. Is it anything I can do?' All the ladies said, "'Poor child!' on receiving this distressing intelligence about Edith and the minute lapdog in Mrs. Shaw's arms began to bark, as if excited by the burst of pity. "'Hush, Tiny, you naughty little girl! You will waken your mistress! It was only to ask Edith if she would tell Newton to bring down her shawls. Perhaps you would go, Margaret, dear?' Margaret went up into the old nursery at the very top of the house, where Newton was busy getting up some laces which were required for the wedding. While Newton went, not without a muttered grumbling, to undo the shawls, which had already been exhibited four or five times that day, Margaret looked round upon the nursery, the first room in that house with which she had become familiar nine years ago, when she was brought all untamed from the forest to share the home, the play, and the lessons of her cousin Edith. She remembered the dark, dim look of the London nursery, presided over by an austere and ceremonious nurse, who was terribly particular about clean hands and torn frocks. She recollected the first tea up there, separate from her father and aunt, who were dining somewhere down below an infinite depth of stairs. For unless she were up in the sky, the child thought, they must be deep down in the bowels of the earth. At home, before she came to live in Harley Street, her mother's dressing-room had been her nursery, and as they kept early hours in the country parsonage, Margaret had always had her meals with her father and mother. Oh, well did the tall, stately girl of eighteen remember the tears shed with such wild passion of grief by the little girl of nine, as she hid her face under the bedclothes in that first night, and how she was bidden not to cry by the nurse because it would disturb Miss Edith, and how she had cried as bitterly but more quietly till her newly seen, grand, pretty aunt had come softly upstairs with Mr. Hale to show him his little sleeping daughter. Then the little Margaret had hushed her sobs, and tried to lie quiet as if asleep, for fear of making her father unhappy by her grief, which she dared not express before her aunt, and which she rather thought it was wrong to feel at all after the long hoping and planning and contriving they had gone through at home, before her wardrobe could be arranged so as to suit her grander circumstances, and before papa could leave his parish to come up to London, even for a few days. Now she had got to love the old nursery, though it was but a dismantled place, and she looked all round, with a kind of cat-like regret, at the idea of leaving it for ever in three days. "'Ah, Newton,' said she, "'I think we shall all be sorry to leave this dear old room.' "'Indeed, miss, I shan't for one. My eyes are not so good as they were, and the light here is so bad that I can't see to mend laces except just at the window, where there's always a shocking draught, enough to give one one's death of cold. 
"'Well, I dare say you will have both good light and plenty of warmth at Naples. "'You must keep as much of your darning as you can till then. "'Thank you, Newton. I can take them down. You're busy.' "'So Margaret went down laden with shawls and snuffing up their spicy eastern smell. "'Her aunt asked her to stand as a sort of lay figure on which to display them, "'as Edith was still asleep. "'No one thought about it, but Margaret's tall, finely made figure, "'in the black silk dress which she was wearing as mourning for some distant relative of her father's, set off the long, beautiful folds of the gorgeous shawls that would have half smothered Edith. Margaret stood right under the chandelier, quite silent and passive, while her aunt adjusted the draperies. Occasionally, as she was turned about, she caught a glimpse of herself in the mirror over the chimney-piece, and smiled at her own appearance there, the familiar features in the usual garb of a princess. She touched the shawls gently as they hung around her, and took a pleasure in their soft feel and their brilliant colours, and rather liked to be dressed in such splendour, enjoying it much as a child would do, with a quiet, pleased smile on her lips. Just then the door opened, and Mr. Henry Lennox was suddenly announced. Some of the ladies started back, as if half ashamed of their feminine interest in dress. Mrs. Shaw held out her hand to the newcomer. Margaret stood perfectly still, thinking she might yet be wanted as a sort of block for the shawls, but looking at Mr. Lennox with a bright, amused face, as if sure of his sympathy and her sense of the ludicrousness at being thus surprised. Her aunt was so much absorbed in asking Mr. Henry Lennox, who had not been able to come to dinner, all sorts of questions about his brother the bridegroom, his sister the bridesmaid, coming with the captain from Scotland for the occasion, and various other members of the Lennox family, that Margaret saw she was no more wanted as a shawl-bearer and devoted herself to the amusement of the other visitors, whom her aunt had for the moment forgotten. Almost immediately Edith came in from the back drawing-room, winking and blinking her eyes at the stronger light, shaking back her slightly ruffled curls, and altogether looking like the sleeping beauty just startled from her dreams. Even in her slumber she had instinctively felt that a Lennox was worth rousing herself for, and she had a multitude of questions to ask about dear Janet, the future unseen sister-in-law, for whom she professed so much affection, that if Margaret had not been very proud, she might have almost felt jealous of that mushroom rival. As Margaret sank rather more into the background on her aunt's joining the conversation, she saw Henry Lennox directing his look towards a vacant seat near her, and she knew perfectly well that as soon as Edith released him from her questioning, he would take possession of that chair. She had not been quite sure, from her aunt's rather confused account of his engagements, whether he would come that night. It was almost a surprise to see him, and now she was sure of a pleasant evening. He liked and disliked pretty nearly the same things that she did. Margaret's face was lightened up to an honest, open brightness. By and by he came. She received him with a smile which had not a tinge of shyness or self-consciousness in it. "'Well, I suppose you are all in the depths of business. Ladies' business, I mean.' very different to my business, which is the real, true law business. Playing with shawls is very different work to drawing up settlements. Ah, I knew you would be amused to find us all so occupied in admiring finery. But really, Indian shawls are very perfect things of their kind. I have no doubt they are. Their prices are very perfect, too. Nothing wanting. The gentlemen came dropping in one by one, and the buzz and noise deepened in tone. "'This is your last dinner-party, is it not? "'There are no more before Thursday?' "'No, I think after this evening we shall feel at rest, "'which I am sure I have not done for many weeks. "'At least that kind of rest when the hands have nothing more to do, "'and all the arrangements are complete for an event "'which must occupy one's head and heart. "'I shall be glad to have time to think, and I am sure Edith will. "'I'm not so sure about her, but I can fancy that you will. "'Whenever I have seen you lately, "'you have been carried away by a whirlwind of some other person's making.' "'Yes,' said Margaret, rather sadly, remembering the never-ending commotion about trifles that had been going on for more than a month past. "'I wonder if a marriage must always be preceded by what you call a whirlwind, or whether in some cases there might not rather be a calm and peaceful time just before it.' "'Cinderella's godmother ordering the trousseau, the wedding breakfast, writing the notes of invitation, for instance,' said Mr. Lennox, laughing. "'But are all these quite necessary troubles?' asked Margaret, looking up straight at him for an answer. A sense of indescribable weariness of all the arrangements for a pretty effect, in which Edith had been busied as supreme authority for the last six weeks, oppressed her just now, and she really wanted someone to help her to a few pleasant, quiet ideas connected with a marriage. "'Oh, of course,' with a change to gravity in his tone. 
There are forms and ceremonies to be gone through, not so much to satisfy oneself as to stop the world's mouth, without which stoppage there would be very little satisfaction in life. But how would you have a wedding arranged?' "'Oh, I have never thought much about it. Only I should like it to be a very fine summer morning. And I should like to walk to church through the shade of trees, and not to have so many bridesmaids, and to have no wedding breakfast.' I dare say I am resolving against the very things that have given me the most trouble just now. No, I don't think you are. The idea of stately simplicity accords well with your character. Margaret did not quite like this speech. She winced away from it more, from remembering former occasions on which he had tried to lead her into a discussion, in which he took the complimentary part, about her own character and ways of going on. She cut his speech rather short by saying, "'It is natural for me to think of Helston Church "'and the walk to it rather than of driving up to a London church "'in the middle of a paved street. "'Tell me about Helston. "'You have never described it to me. "'I should like to have some idea of the place you will be living in "'when 96 Harley Street will be looking dingy and dirty and dull and shut up. "'Is Helston a village or a town in the first place? "'Oh, only a hamlet. "'I don't think I could call it a village at all. "'There is the church and a few houses near it on the green.' "'cottages, rather, with roses growing all over them. "'And flowering all the year round, especially at Christmas. "'Make your picture complete,' said he. "'No,' replied Margaret, somewhat annoyed. "'I am not making a picture. "'I am trying to describe Helston as it really is. "'You should not have said that.' "'I am penitent,' he answered. "'Only it really sounded like a village in a tale rather than in real life.' "'And so it is,' replied Margaret eagerly. All the other places in England that I have seen seem so hard and prosaic-looking after the new forest. Helston is like a village in a poem, in one of Tennyson's poems. But I won't try and describe it any more. You would only laugh at me if I told you what I think of it, what it really is. Indeed, I would not. But I see you are going to be very resolved. Well, then, tell me that which I should like still better to know what the parsonage is like. Oh, I can't describe my home. It is home. "'and I can't put its charm into words.' "'I submit. You are rather severe to-night, Margaret.' "'How?' said she, turning her large, soft eyes round full upon him. "'I did not know I was. "'Why, because I made an unlucky remark, "'you will neither tell me what Helston is like, "'nor will you say anything about your home, "'though I have told you how much I want to hear about both, "'the latter especially. "'But indeed I cannot tell you about my own home. "'I don't quite think it is a thing to be talked about, "'unless you knew it.' "'Well, then,' pausing for a moment, "'tell me what you do there. "'Here you read, or have lessons, "'or otherwise improve your mind till the middle of the day, "'take a walk before lunch, "'go a drive with your aunt after, "'and have some kind of engagement in the evening. "'There, now fill up your day at Helston. "'Shall you ride, drive, or walk?' "'Walk decidedly. "'We have no horse, not even for Papa. "'He walks to the very extremity of his parish. "'The walks are so beautiful, "'it would be a shame to drive, "'almost a shame to ride.' "'Shall you garden much? "'That, I believe, is a proper employment for young ladies in the country.' "'I don't know. "'I am afraid I shan't like such hard work. "'Archery parties, picnics, race balls, hunt balls?' "'Oh, no,' said she, laughing. "'Papa's living is very small. "'And even if we were near such things, I doubt if I should go to them.' "'I see. "'You won't tell me anything. "'You will only tell me that you are not going to do this and that.' "'Before the vacation ends, I think I shall pay you a call "'and see what you really do employ yourself in. "'I hope you will. "'Then you will see for yourself how beautiful Helston is. "'Now I must go. "'Edith is sitting down to play, "'and I just know enough of music to turn over the leaves for her. "'And besides, Aunt Shaw won't like us to talk.' "'Edith played brilliantly. "'In the middle of the piece, the door half opened, "'and Edith saw Captain Lennox hesitating whether to come in. "'She threw down her music and rushed out of the room.' leaving Margaret standing confused and blushing to explain to the astonished guests what vision had shown itself to cause Edith's sudden flight. Captain Lennox had come earlier than was expected, or was it really so late? They looked at their watches, were duly shocked, and took their leave. Then Edith came back, glowing with pleasure, half shyly, half proudly, leading in her tall, handsome captain. His brother shook hands with him, and Mrs. Shaw welcomed him in her gentle, kindly way, which had always something plaintive in it, arising from the long habit of considering herself a victim to an uncongenial marriage. Now that, the general being gone, she had every good of life, with as few drawbacks as possible, she had been rather perplexed to find, upon her own health, 
as a source of apprehension. She had a nervous little cough whenever she thought about it, and some complacent doctor ordered her just what she desired, a winter in Italy. Mrs. Shaw had as strong wishes as most people, but she never liked to do anything from the opened and acknowledged motive of her own good will and pleasure. She preferred being compelled to gratify herself by some other person's command or desire. She really did persuade herself that she was submitting to some hard external necessity, and thus she was able to moan and complain in her soft manner, all the time she was in reality doing just what she liked. It was in this way she began to speak of her own journey to Captain Lennox, who assented, as in duty bound, to all his future mother-in-law said, while his eyes sought Edith, who was busying herself in rearranging the tea-table, and ordering up all sorts of good things, in spite of his assurances that he had dined within the last two hours. Mr. Henry Lennox stood leaning against the chimney-piece, amused with the family scene. He was close by his handsome brother. He was the plain one in a singularly good-looking family, but his face was intelligent, keen and mobile, and now and then Margaret wondered what it was that he could be thinking about, while he kept silence, but was evidently observing, with an interest that was slightly sarcastic, all that Edith and she were doing. The sarcastic feeling was called out by Mrs. Shaw's conversation with his brother. It was separate from the interest which was excited by what he saw. He thought it a pretty sight to see the two cousins so busy in their little arrangements about the table. Edith chose to do most herself. She was in a humour to enjoy showing her lover how well she could behave as a soldier's wife. She found out that the water in the urn was cold, and ordered up the great kitchen tea-kettle, the only consequence of which was that when she met it at the door, and tried to carry it in, it was too heavy for her, and she came in pouting, with a black mark on her muslin gown, and a little round white hand indented by the handle, which she took to show Captain Lennox, just like a hurt child, and, of course, the remedy was the same in both cases. Margaret's quickly adjusted spirit lamp was the most efficacious contrivance, though not so like the gypsy encampment which Edith, in some of her moods, chose to consider the nearest resemblance to a barrack life. After this evening all was bustle till the wedding was over. End of chapter 1